Welcome to the HBO Sessions vs Thronecast, an ugly collision between two fine web video specials dedicated to the best blinking show on television. Game of Thrones is, on the face of it, a complex web of characters, families, locations, politics, violence, intrigue, swords, blood, wolves and rumpy pumpy. There are so many questions. Who are the White Walkers? And if they only walk, why is it so difficult to run away from them? Are the Targaryens the blondest people to have ever existed without being albino? Is Khal Drogo the biggest military party animal since Prince Harry? And is the love between a queen and her brother simply confirmation of our suspicions that all royal families really have quite a shallow gene pool? The answer to none of these questions is coming up, but what we will do is examine how well this TV epic stacks up against the possibly even better series of books. I'll be doing a little dance with the man charged with bringing to life one of the, in my opinion, best of the minor characters in the series. We'll examine how the costumes can tell you a lot more about the naked people underneath them, and I'll be sitting amongst properly qualified experts in the field of watching telly to talk more about what makes Game of Thrones so flipping brilliant. I'm joined in this here studio on one side by bespectacled journalist Georgie Hobbs and Sky Atlantic uber-loitant the bearded Ben Boyer and on the other side by Lords and Masters of Westeros.org the only place for discerning Game of Thrones fans to congregate and do whatever Game of Thrones fans do. It's Elio and Linda, hello. So uh, let's, let's start with you Ben. What is it do you think about Game of Thrones which has made it such a big hit? Well, in the early stages of development of the thing, uh, David Benioff, one of the co-creators, was being interviewed by a magazine uh, before anybody knew anything about the show, just knew that HBO had made the deal, and he was asked to describe it, and he described it as The Sopranos in Middle Earth. And I think a lot of those guys have probably come to sort of roll their eyes at that description now, but at the time it was sort of the perfect shorthand to get people into it who might ordinarily be scared off of a fantasy type show. Because that's an interesting thing, I think fantasy is often scary to people. Were you, were you terrified, Georgie? Um, I really thought it was something I wasn't going to be able to get into at all. You know, and then they rolled out dragon's eggs as a wedding present and like gang rape and stuff and I thought, no, this is not for me. But then actually it completely won me over by like the second episode. And of course uh, the pair of you were well aware of it beforehand yeah. Yeah. Um, be because of the books. Did, did you think it would cross over to a mainstream audience or did you think it was going to be uh, your thing, it was going to be a thing for the fans? We'd already seen that with the book fans. There were a lot of people saying, I normally don't read fantasy, but I really like this. So it certainly had that appeal to readers as well. It wasn't just for fantasy readers. Yeah. And, and do you think that uh, Sopranos in Middle Earth is a, is a good description, Elio? I recall David uh, more recently saying, like, kind of rolling his eyes as yeah. he said about it. Um, I think it gets the idea of the, I think the most important part is the family dynamic of the Sopranos. It's really a major part of a show of you. It's, a, it's a, almost a family drama. Um, very epic and like a saga from the old Icelandic period or whatever. Uh, it was really, I think something people can relate to. It's got everything. I mean, it's, it's several genres in one. I think if you watch the first episode, you've got horror, you've got family melodrama, you've got thriller, you've got, and then tons of sex and wolf puppies. It's sort of, if you're not entertained by that <laughs> first episode. It's just an average episode, evening at my house. <laughs> yeah. Now, Game of Thrones is a properly lavish production. And the costumes play no small part in that. Here's Chris Laverty from clothesonfilm.com to stroke the furs, rummage under the armor, and rip off the jerkins, if not the merkins. Game of Thrones is fantasy costume 101. It is immense. There is fur, there is armor, there is leather armor, peasant dresses, Grecian dresses, tribal wear, it's most inspired by the Middle Ages, but there are many influences at work here. Each kingdom has its own specific look. Winterfell has a color palette of greys and browns. It's very cold, so all the costumes are topped in fur. It's the most medieval inspired of all the kingdoms. King's Landing is softer. There are reds and beiges, linens and silks. It is more Persian inspired. At the wall, everything is bathed in an icy blue glow. The uniform of the Night's Watch is a black scale armour, very similar to that worn by a samurai. By looking at a costume in Game of Thrones, it can help us read who the characters are. Arya is a tomboy. During early episodes, she has torn the sleeves off her dresses, unlike her very feminine sister. Then later, she changes into trousers and a linen shirt while learning how to fence. 
What starts out as a running joke on the show, that she is often mistaken for a boy, eventually becomes a very important narrative point. Arya is like her father, Ned Stark, who cares nothing for clothes, unlike Jamie Lannister, who would proudly display the padded leather beneath his armor. The Dothraki, of course, have their own name for armor, steel dresses. Their clothing is scant, but meaningful and tribal. By looking at costume in Game of Thrones, it can help us decipher who characters are and how they evolve throughout the episodes. Now, and this is exciting, there's a chance for you to win a box set of season one of Game of Thrones on Blu-ray, plus a Blu-ray player with which to watch it on. All you've got to do is tweet us before the 18th of March at HBO underscore UK with the hashtag play or die. And you can be our friend on Facebook and check out our exceptionally groovy website. All the details are flashing before you now, like Ros's groin on the back of a wagon. Georgie, we've talked about the raunch. Do you think, despite that, it's a show full of strong female characters? Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, all of the prostitutes, for example, are amazing. Like, as Ben mentioned, Roz is really smart. And she, she gives, like, really good one-liners while she's um, <clears throat> in the act. That's <laughs> how you do it. <laughs> I need to maybe watch it again <laughs> to get some tips. Um, but equally, you know, like, Arya Stark is amazing. And at the end of the show, she's referred to as a boy because she has these amazing masculine traits that she's not allowed to. I think there's a, a, a special shout out to, to Danny, Daenerys Targaryen, who yeah. has this incredible arc through the series. When you first see her, couldn't be further from, from how she ends up. And the moment she yeah. starts gnawing on that heart, <laughs> yeah. you realize that, that there's no going back. And does that arc continue for Danny? Do we see her become stronger and stronger without giving too much away? She certainly has a very interesting journey. She is definitely one of my favourite characters, if not the favourite, and uh, she has I, perhaps the most fantastical journey, I think. She is really the, um, the reintroduction of magic in the setting. And I'll tell you something that I thought was interesting, is we've already talked about how the fact that there are planned to be seven books. Um, now, obviously they're casting these characters very early on, Really? Uh, do, do you think the, the kid actors especially, do you think they'll be able to go the distance? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think um, that was probably one of the key castings, one of the most difficult castings they've said is figuring out the right kids. I think uh, you mentioned Aria, Maisie Williams is absolutely fantastic and she has quite a journey ahead of her. So I think I was listening to a commentary on the Blu-ray and they mentioned she was almost literally the last actress they saw for the role, like out of 200 kids for, and she just got it. Right, we'll chat some more in a little while. Now, one of the best bits of Game of Thrones is the fighting. And one of the classiest fighters in the whole of Westeros is Arya's dancing instructor, Sirio Farrell, who's played by Miltos Uremalu. And he's here now to tell me how to do dancing and fighting with sticks. So Miltos, how was Game of Thrones for you? Uh, it was a, a boy's own adventure experience. It was one of those uh, amazing once in a lifetime. Sorry, uh, boy's own rather than boy's own. So it wasn't like a boy band experience, but right. it was definitely like a fantasy experience. And um, it was like just getting to play a character that is cool and very good at sword fighting and experienced and wise and all of those kind of things is always like a fantastic thing to do. So how did it happen then? I just got a call to uh, to go for a casting. Uh, by and at that Gold. stage, did you get any sense of what it was? Did no. you, you'd never heard of the books? No, I think like most of us, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. we're like going, oh, we've kind of, uh, all right, so it's fantasy. You go into the fantasy uh, and science fiction section and it's number one and you go, Wow, okay, so this is, uh, this is quite important. It's a big deal, you yeah. You start yeah. reading it and you realise just why. So tell me about your first day there. Was it, was it like going to school for the first time? We kind of figured out what the style was, this idea of the water dancer. I had to kind of like, I had to be creative. It's not written in any yeah. of his books. So, um, so do you feel like you could now kill a man? With a sword. Listen, the amount, <laughs> the amount of time I've spent wielding that thing, yes, <laughs> probably could. But I mustn't put that, you mustn't put that on camera because what happens if there's a, like... <laughs> if there's a sword murder, a sword you murder, are I'm number be, one I'm, suspect. I know, I think yeah. so. So <laughs> we have to be, shh. Um, no, I couldn't possibly kill anyone with a sword. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you mind showing me some moves? Uh, yeah, of course. Great, I'll, I'll warn you now, I'm the least coordinated uh, person that you've ever met. I am. <laughs> but I'm a bludgeoner. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> not bad, not bad. Ow, <laughs> hey, man, no, no cheating. Right, stand side face. Okay. Yes, like this. Oh, you're doing the voice, it's good. it's good. Stand face, stand. <laughs> yes, it's side facing, that's it. Good, good, you're, um, you're average. <laughs> look, look at that though, that's like a ballerina's <laughs> foot. All right, one hand. Okay. I'm jumping around a lot. Is, is no, that wrong? you've got to be still. Uh, still you've got still. to be like water. Okay, like water. You've got to flow. That's it. I feel That's that if I ever flow. came came across Slow. an actual knife attacker, they would have. <laughs> <laughs> I feel almost capable of uh, defending myself if there's another riot. Yes. Though I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a sword. Well, one of these plastic swords might come in very handy. <laughs> uh, Miltus, thank you very much. Pleasure. Cheers. Don't forget, if you love Game of Thrones, or if you just want to show your appreciation for the noble work of HBO in general, you can become our friend on Facebook, you can peruse our fine website, and retweet our tweets. If you tweet us back with the hashtag PlayOrDie, a Blu-ray player, and more importantly, a set of season one DVDs could be yours. And so to wrap up, and let's get our money's worth from you lot, what's the strongest aspect of Game of Thrones? Maybe starting with Elio this time. I think it has to be the, the breadth of it. It's such an epic sweeping story that covers so many areas, so many places, so many different themes and storylines. And you really get a sense of scale as well. It's, you know, the, Westeros feels like this huge place. You know, when you see the wall, that opening shot, and you're just like, wow, this is, it's big. And it's literally big and it's figuratively big. Linda? I think the fact that it is fantasy still, and it still manages not to get cheesy or corny or anything like that. You have the fantasy elements, it doesn't shy away from them. They're, the, they're there and they're really working. So you get the whole blend of all these different genres and it's really coming together. You've got all the elements of it and you've got great characterization and showing that fantasy can in fact have all of these things. Georgie, what works most for you? I think conversely for me, it's um, how real world it seems. I always prefer it when um, things sort of reflect real life. Um, so just the politics and the machinations of, um, of the actual Game of Thrones, as it were, is my favourite bit. And, and when the smaller characters like Sam come into it, he seems so real world. And you just think, what are you doing on, on this fantasy world? I really like that. It really brings it home for me. So. And I think it's the storytelling. I think with, with stuff like this, like you were saying, with the genre stuff in particular, you have to, the people behind the camera and in front of the camera need to commit completely to it. And these people all do. It's, it's so vivid and so real and everybody means everything. And by the end of it, if you're not on the edge of your couch, you know, it, it, it's, you, you will be. And also the sex and wolf puppies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it for this special hybrid HBO session. Remember, winter is coming. So I'd recommend getting some kind of hat and maybe a scarf while the sales are still on.